All right. Hello, Wise Skillman. Okay. Good to see you. Thank you. All right. Thanks for joining us. And thank you, everybody, for coming. We are here for our October seminar on the magic of life insurance. And believe you me, it is a magical product. And I personally take a lot of satisfaction out of running these seminars because it reminds me about how magical this product is. So today we are going to discuss how adventurous people, people with adventurous vocations or applications can get good deals on life insurance. Um, it is a topic close to my heart because I really enjoy getting these people underwritten. Um, I like people who um, like to climb and dive and jump out of planes and do all kinds of fun things. <laughs> so I admire them and, and I really enjoy working with them. We have Darren with us. Darren's my right arm, consultant, financial planner, underwriter, good guy. We have Charlene with us my other right arm, chief of marketing, pet whisperer, and um, country music fan. So mm -hmm. we have some of our, our, our finest team members with us today. Um, if you have a question, you can put it in the chat. If it's personal, we'll set up a private conversation. If it's general to the topic, we'll, let, we'll try to address it uh, during the course of our seminar. And as we always do, we will be making a copy, uh, a recording of the seminar and posting it on our website and also sending a link to everybody that participates. Feel free to share that. Okay, Darren, so let's get down to it. So here's question number one. And I've been asked this by so many people. Why is it that people that do scuba diving and rock climbing and mountain climbing, why is it that these folks are considered in quotes, high risk by the life insurance industry. I mean, if you ask them personally, they'll say, hey, I'm, in, I'm fit, I'm in condition, I'm safe, I follow all the precautions, no worries. You know, so why would the life insurance underwriters um, tend to think of them as being higher risk? What do you think? Yeah, Steve, good question. So I always remind people in the scope of underwriting that uh, remember, life insurance carriers are creatures of, of statistics. They're actuaries. You and I, we've had this conversation. Uh, life insurance companies are run by attorneys and actuaries, right? So the actuaries are the ones who are actually uh, crunching the numbers as far as life expectancy and maybe certain tendencies, whether it's medical, uh, avocations, uh, occupations, hobbies, what have you, that might impact someone's life expectancy. Um, it's really all they care about as far as, um, you know, how they, how they derive their premium structures and their profitability is, how long do we think this person is going to live? Um, and again, they're, again, the law of large numbers, they're looking at, you know, John Q. Public, uh, this guy is, uh, you know, this generic person that does these things. He goes to work, he come, comes home and plays with the kids and has dinner and watches a ball game and, and goes to bed. Well, there's a certain risk parameter with that. So they're saying, hey, if you're jumping out of airplanes, if you're scaling, uh, you know, high mountain peaks, if you're diving, uh, you know, the ocean blue, our, our feeling is, Statistically, you're at a greater risk. So their uh, pricing reflects that. Okay, so so it's a data-driven decision. Perfectly. Um, yeah. And um, which is actually to everybody's benefit. It's to the consumer's benefit that there is hard data to back up the judgments, the mortality judgments, the mortality assessments of underwriters. Okay, it's not arbitrary. It's an extremely informed decision. Okay, so so there. So let's take it a step further. Mm -hmm. um, granted that there's certain data that would say that somebody who engages in these activities could be a higher mortality risk than somebody that doesn't. 
how would underwriters distinguish between, let's say, one climber and another determine one has a greater chance of dying versus another? Um, how do they differentiate? Yeah, so it would be everything I just said, but what they're looking for is the person that is engaged in the specific hobby, let's say climbing. However, they're going to look at proficiency. How often does this person do it? Meaning, are they experienced? Are they really good at it? Uh, what type of safety precautions do they take? Are they, are they up you know, to snuff on all the latest and greatest uh, equipment? Uh, clips, clamps, ropes, boots, you know, all the, all the gear are, do they have, you know, good stuff? Are they using it appropriately? Um, and then training, do they have the education? There's different, uh, uh, you know, memberships or diff different, uh, you know, levels of achievement that they can, they can attain. Um, and just, so what, what they're saying is, Hey, look, we acknowledge this person is doing something um, that is both actuarially hazardous and, you know, common sense hazardous. However, uh, we feel like we can take the ones that are doing everything, you know, the very best of the best of the right way with all the, you know, precautions. We think we can treat those people very similar, similarly to someone who doesn't do it. So that's, that's the but. Right. So your emphasis on proficiency mm -hmm. um, within each activity, each climber, let's say, brings a different level of, of proficiency, of capability, of frequency, um, all the various factors that fit into that particular activity. People are different. OK. Mm -hmm. And I remember a long time ago when I started placing climbers and divers, um, it was a big effort to get underwriters to, to see the differences. And that's why we developed this very comprehensive questionnaire. Because too often, I found that when you said the word climber, uh, an underwriter would automatically start thinking mountain climber, as opposed to, let's say, rock climber, as opposed to, let's say, boulderer, and lumping everybody in this activity the same, when clearly a, a, a a boulderer does not have the same amount of risk as a rock climber, does not have the same amount of risk as a mountain climber. Okay. So um, that took some effort and, and it led me to think, and it led a lot of climbers and divers to ask, well, you know, are there companies out there that will take these kinds of risks? I mean, I have not found there to be the climbing company or the diving company. Have you? Um, I mean, we can say with certainty, we know, uh, and again, you, we're, for people watching, we're, we're brokers, which mean we, we work with all the insurance companies. We work with all the companies to benefit the client. Whoever treats our client the most favorably is obviously the one that we'll present to our client. With that said, you've got, you know, all these different insurance companies that have uh, different parameters. They, they use... Uh, different underwriting manuals. So in essence, they're saying, well, our actuaries think differently than your actuaries. So to answer your question, yeah, we can have the exact same risk profile, the exact same climber or diver and get radically different, uh, you know, quotes from, from different companies. Uh, we, it goes from somebody loves him, they think he's a standard risk to we've got other companies that just say, no, we'll pass. That's not not up our alley. Wait, so this is a product of exactly what? In-house expertise, experience, like what does what distinguishes, what gives one company the comfort needed to be more aggressive in underwriting than another company? It's it's literally their their formal underwriting rules. So each company subscribes to their own underwriting manual. Uh, there's literally a book. Well, it's online now. But uh, yeah, they actually have their rules as far as how they treat uh, everything under the sun, not just climbers and divers, but pilots and bungee jumpers and skydivers and you know anything you can possibly think of, they reference their manual. 
Um, so there's companies just out of the gate who are who are or are not going to be competitive with you know a certain activity. Now, within that realm, you know, underwriters are human beings with with you know with brains, so they can say, well, here's what the manual is telling me. But I see because of how Stephen Darren presented this client, I've got really good information. I think I can do a little bit better. I think this this individual is a little bit better risk than what the book tells me. So they they can deviate from what their rules are within reason if it makes sense. Um, but again, sometimes you're just going to be you know so far apart that company X and company Y, um, you know, you're going to go to company Y just because their uh, official rules, their manual, their procedures uh, are are just more aggressive with climbers. I get that. Um, and it brings to mind, I remember National Life, National of Vermont, mm -hmm. a long time ago, gobbled up a lot of the cases for, for candidates who were private pilots. Mm -hmm. And I later found out it's because the president of the company had him, was himself a pilot. Yeah. He had a license. I remember that. So based on what you're saying, so he must have had a hand in writing their manual for for underwriting pilots um, based on his expertise and experience. You know, is that you think that's true? He in that case, the president of the company um, helped set the rules that the underwriters follow based on his knowledge. A hundred percent. And in my own personal experience, so I started with the Prudential. I was a home office underwriter for Prudential. And our director of underwriting, the, the head guy, he was a he was a big guy, heavy. Um, shockingly, not he was very generous towards uh, heavy heavy clients. And even to this day, as you know, Prudential's build chart uh, is still one of the most generous in the industry. So it's yeah, there's some human element to to their rules. The book says this. Um, so maybe the president either formally or informally said, hey, I, I think we can do a little bit better because here's what I know about private pilots um, or in my case, you know, heavy, uh, heavy people. Um, so, yeah, yeah. But again, that's our role is, is to figure out which companies are going to treat uh, our clients the best. All right. So so. So in the case of a company being aggressive with a scuba diver or a rock climber or a mountain climber, um, it means that that company's set of underwriting rules are not necessarily lenient, but I like to call it, um, they have a high level of comfort and confidence with that risk um, based on, you know, they have a knowledge of that activity uh, and a comfort level greater than other companies. Um, it's not necessarily that their, their rules might not even be that different from another company's, but because they have experience, um, they're, they're emotionally, they're a little bit more comfortable taking on the risk and being a little bit more aggressive just because they're comfortable. Does that make sense? It's kind of, I've always considered it to be the, the art versus the science of underwriting, um, the comfort level and experience that an underwriter has with a certain, with let's say in this case, climbing, mm -hmm. would lead them to be more aggressive. Did yeah, I mean, we even that? call it we we'll, we'll call it intelligent underwriting, meaning right they they right or wrong they feel like they know a little bit more uh, a little bit more in tune than than maybe what the statistics what the actuaries are saying, um, you know, based on their on their math, they think well, gosh. Yeah, but you've got, you know, this client, uh, he's, he's a practicing attorney, he's, he's high income, he's married, uh, which adds an element of stability, he has children, uh, so they're building a profile, okay, we, we, we know this guy climbs, we're, we're not discounting that, um, he's, he's uh, high income, um, so we know he's buying the, the best of the best equipment, he's going on these excursions, um, they'll even look at where the excursions are. If, if you're if you if you're climbing, um, you know, in, in a first world country in, in the United States, you know, God forbid if something happened, they know you have access, you know, to medical care. 
versus you know somewhere you know deep in uh you know mike south america yeah i, no, I get say, that south right America, where it's going to take an ambulance or a helicopter four <laughs> hours to get there so yeah so they look at so much uh information but back you know to what we always tout is is the pre-qualification piece and having done this so long um, you know, we, we know the playbook, meaning, okay, here's what, here's what the underwriter is going to want to see. So we've, we've created very detailed, uh, questionnaires that are going to pick off all the key points that, that they're going to be interested in. And then I go out and we talk to Transamerica and AIG and John Hancock and Prudential and Protective and, and get a sense of, uh, before we, you know, in essence, uh, lift a finger or go through any type of underwriting, we already know with a, with a good degree of certainty who's gonna you know, be more aggressive. Right, that's the second time you mentioned pre-qualification, which is key. I mean, again, the, you know, the whole point of pre-qualification is for somebody to be able to, for a potential applicant to be able to safely but effectively test the water safely meaning without really risking a any official inquiry so they're not risking a, a declination or, or rating on their official record of insurance applications but effectively meaning that we are able to get real numbers give them a real quote um, based even sometimes in conversations with underwriters so it it, it, it this has been a way um that that especially people with adventurous hobbies have been able to test the waters because the more thorough and accurate is the quote information we provide an underwriter on a preliminary basis the more confident they are that this case will not fall apart during underwriting and that's the that's the nightmare in which everybody loses if you fail to give the 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 broad picture of this person's activities and they submit an application and then in middle of underwriting, then we find out about the five trips to wherever that they climb. Whoops. Then the entire picture underwriting profile can change. And the underwriter is gonna say, forget table B, this is gonna be a table six. And the client's not interested, the underwriter spent a bunch of money for nothing and we wasted our time, didn't get the business. So I have found that pre-qualification has been vital to getting good rates for these guys. You hit uh, you hit you hit a key there is um, the the companies as you know any company not just insurance companies everybody's trying to hone their efficiencies right they want to become more efficient and save money or at least be spending money in the right places so uh, you know companies welcome working with advisors that take the time to do thorough pre qualification. Um, I forget what the number is. I think the average cost for an insurance company to underwrite someone, meaning you know, process the the, the paperwork and pay the underwriter, and uh, you're, you're usually getting an insurance exam at some point, medical records. I mean, it's it's thousands of dollars before they even potentially you know receive a, a dime of of premium. So you know over over the years, they've actually kind of pushed back and said, hey guys, speaking broadly to, to all the agents and advisors out there, you guys need to do a better job. Um, you know, be sure you're sending us the right clients. And then, you know, barring any surprises, anything you didn't tell us about, uh, we're gonna give you a really good idea of, of what premium range you should, you should expect. Uh, if you find that suitable, by all means, apply. And you know we'll we'll do our underwriting. We we firm up the formal pricing, and then as you know, we circle back with the client. We've got the bird in the hand. Here's the formal pricing. Uh, let's revisit different illustrations we looked at initially. Do you want a one million, two million? You you want a ten year term, a twenty year term? You wanted something permanent? Uh, we dial that in and send it back and get the policy issued, and it just makes our life easier. That's right. It makes everybody's life easier. And, you know, that is like when an underwriter does not want his time wasted, he wants a good case. He wants he wants to issue a policy. He wants everybody to he wants the company to make money. So a lot of times when a client will say to me, well, you know, my accountant or my planner or another guy offered to 
help me shop for this insurance, why should I use you? And my point is, well, we have decades of experience placing somebody who climbs or somebody who dives, and we have a very good track record with underwriters, and they know our cases don't fall apart. We don't burn anybody. We, we treat them with respect and want them to get business. So um, if somebody, if another broker, even if they're a, a very high money-making broker, but if they're not experienced in placing these kinds of cases, they're not gonna have that track record or that reputation with underwriters. So that doesn't mean they're gonna, and they, they may not get the same kind of underwriting we get because of our ability to, our reputation, our ability to, to work with underwriters and give them thorough and accurate information. I think underwriters are, you know, they're obviously key to the process and they can't be taken for granted. Yeah. Right, there's one more question uh, I have, if you don't mind. So let, let's address the scenario of somebody who was underwritten three years ago as a climber or a diver. Maybe they were young and single and adventurous at that point, and now they're married, three kids, and their spouse is like, chill, you know, we, we got to calm down now. There's too much at stake here. And they then they really do. Oh, I got a message from the computer here. And they really do cut down on their activity. Um, what is the possibility of them saving money on their policy? Yeah, I mean, that's that's a real world example. We actually had a client like that recently. Um, and you cut out for a second. I missed I missed um, I missed a, a little bit, but I, I know where you're going with this. Um, yeah. So as as someone's activities change, it's, a, it's the same analogy as someone's like health improving. Right. So if, if whatever that event or um, activity is that's causing, you know, concern with an insurance company, if, if that has uh, decreased or, or maybe stopped, uh, an example I've had recently, a guy was uh, a mountain climber. I mean, he was out there doing the big, the big hairy climbs. I mean, he was it was no joke. Um, he was doing everything the right way. He was smart, never had accidents. Um, we got him a policy, um, but he paid he paid a, an extra premium uh, because of his activities, which which he understood. Um, fast forward a few years, got married, had children, and we just happened to visit on an annual review. I said, "Hey, I said, are you really gonna keep doing this?" Um, I said, "If you are, great." He's like, "I like to think that I will, but I know that I won't." <laughs> Yeah. So to, to answer your point is he, you know, he did all these, you know, incredible things. And he said, look, if, if anything, I'll, I'll go rock climbing, which basically means just, you know, over some big bumps, he's not using a ropes or in, any need for, for safety equipment, basically like a state park where you go hiking, you know, with the family. I'm like, we need to get you a new policy. There's no way you should be paying, you know, for, for being a mountain climber when you're not. Uh, so yeah, so yeah, we revisit. I mean, that's one of the purposes of, of always doing our annual reviews, um, which I think most people, mo most of our clients appreciate. Some of them, I think we drive them nuts, but you know, we're trying to help them to be sure they still have uh, efficient pricing based on where they are in life and what they're doing. Exactly right. Policy reviews, there could yeah. always be a better deal. Yeah, yeah, good. All right, Darren, to wrap up, any last words? Um, I think we touched on it is, you know, I, as we're talking to, to both clients and maybe other, other financial professionals, other professionals, uh, insurance companies are in the business to sell insurance and they are looking for regular people. Some, you know, and, and as we talk to people, they think, oh, you know, I'm not going to qualify because of, of X, Y, and Z. Between you and me, it's pretty rare uh, that you and I can't place somebody. And if we can't place somebody, usually it's, it's for a very short period of, of time. Right. And uh, so again, just a reminder, um, you know, call us, email us, uh, regardless of what your, what your circumstance is, chances are uh, there's something out there and something actually better than what you think. And if you get pre-qualified, you get nothing to lose. Yeah. Nothing to risk. I get it. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for attending. This is our, our monthly seminar, so stay tuned for November. 
and also stay tuned for our schedule for the upcoming year. Thank you so much and see you next time.